Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here this early or this late, depending on, on how we view it. So today I have the pleasure to be in, uh, in the great company of, uh, of uh, people who are actually change makers and, uh, and in a very complex region that we tend to associate with extremely complex and extremely gloomy pictures. So today we're going to focus on different initiatives and projects and things happening in uh, the Middle East and North Africa that do not normally make it to uh, mainstream media headlines. So it's been four years since people in the Middle East and North Africa took to the streets, uh, feeling both the streets and, and uh, internet channels and, and uh, uh, neighboring countries with hope. But four years later, where are we? We are in an increasingly militarized context, increasingly uh, filtered by geopolitical, geostrategic uh, issues. So where are the voices of the region? Who is working on civil society building? How are they doing it? How can we, from uh, a neighboring country, from a neighboring Mediterranean country in Spain, connect with these different projects working on the ground? How can we better understand their needs, their concerns, their demands in a context where we increasingly hear about the Middle East and North Africa, but we less and less listen to the Middle East and North Africa. So there's a lot of talking about this region, but there's not so much listening and talking to the citizens of the region to know what they really want and what they're working on right now. Um, how can we deal with the increasing polarization in the region? How are citizens dealing with this increasing polarization? Uh, do people in the region have a room to actually have control of their lives, to change what's happening, considering the huge amounts of uh, proxy uh, actors and interests? Uh, um, where, are, where are they now in terms of uh, affecting change in their lives, in their societies. Um, so these are some of the questions that we're going to raise with, uh, with our speakers. Uh, especially because we, I think this is an important step, this kind of events and, and the material that we generate from these discussions. It's key to preserve historic memory in the region. It seems like four, four years later, it is becoming harder to understand how things started and where we're coming from. And the background, the uh, explanations of why we are where we are. So it's increasingly important to preserve memory, to preserve an archive of what's happening and to go back to the roots of uh, uh, the situation where we are right now. So to talk about all of this and um, we're going to talk to Maha Yahya first, and uh, she's a um, senior associate at Carnegie. She works with uh, different civil society organizations, and she's a researcher on issues related to citizenship, pluralism, uh, and social justice in the Middle East and North Africa, and the aftermath of the Arab uprisings. We're also going to talk to Mohammed uh, Maskati from uh, Bahrain. He's a renowned uh, blogger and, and human rights activist, and he's an expert in a very key issue, which is the issue of digital security. So there are security concerns of all kinds, but also digitally, it's important to be aware of what's at stake. And we will also talk to Sali Tuma. Tuma or Toma? Tuma. Sally Tuma, who is a psychiatrist specialized in the very uh, difficult issue of uh, dealing with victims of human rights abuses, victims of torture, and how, uh, how, th how these victims cope with these abuses and what, what happens next. So she's also a founder of, uh, she writes for Mada Masr an Egyptian media outlet, and she's founder of a very interesting uh, campaign called Kazibun, 
which uh, hopefully she will tell us more about. Uh, I'm Leila Nashawati. I'm a Spanish-Syrian uh, writer and professor of communications based here in Madrid. And I'm a founder of, uh, a co-founder of a um, media outlet that I would like you to check, media archive, that's called Syria Untold, which deals and tries to archive all the content that we rarely see on mainstream media, which is civil society in Syria, uh, people working on grassroots campaign in Syria, women's voices in Syria, art, music, all these things that have to do with daily life and daily struggles and daily resistance and that constitute a very important part of reality in these countries. And, uh, and uh, this is also an issue that we will be looking at closely today. So maybe we can start with Maha. I'm going to give the floor to you, Maha. Uh, I want to start first by thinking, uh, thanking Casa Arab and uh, Karim specifically for inviting me to this event. I'm actually delighted to be here and to hear everybody's stories. Um, what I'll be talking about is, as you see, the significance of discontent. This is part of a larger project that I've been working on for a bit now, which is looking at uh, media, at opinion polls that have been conducted in the region over the past decade and a half. Uh, the, the, the information that is available varies from one country to the other, and in my presentation I'll focus mainly on uh, Egypt and Tunisia. Um, I wanted to start with this quote, uh, even though I'm not calling for a Trotskyan uh, approach to the uprisings, but I think it's a very telling one, um, when the idea that all revolutions are impossible until they become inevitable. And I think that in this part of the region, the revolutions that happened were inevitable, and they were just, uh, I mean, it was a matter of time when things were going to take place. Um, oops, sorry, I forgot. Um, I want to start with two stories from the Arab uprisings. Uh, one is a conversation I had with a taxi driver in Egypt a while back, uh, one of the taxi drivers. Uh, I'll, there'll be another one, another story uh, shortly. Um, and when I, this was prior, a bit prior to, uh, I mean, it was after the uh, removal of Morsi, uh, but before the elections of Sisi. And I was talking to him about what he thought of what was going on. His reaction was, there was a knife to our throat and it was removed. And uh, the image struck me. Uh, I was hearing the similar stories from a lot of people. It was the most visual image that he used, but it was the same kind of repeated image, I, or at least description, I would hear from people from very different backgrounds. Uh, some would say it was a colonial rule. Some would say they wanted to change the identity of Egypt. So the question, the issue of, of uh, what the Muslim Brotherhood meant and their rule of one year was something that was very profound and went far beyond um, a, a mode of governance, if you like. And I think Sally perhaps will talk a little bit more about what this traumatic experience for a group of Egyptians meant and how it's actually uh, playing out today in today's Egypt. Um, the other image, um, the, the other conversation was with a young Tunisian. And we were talking about the Arab uprisings. This was this September and what had happened in Tunis. And his reaction was all we got out of the Arab uprisings is inflation. Uh, which sort of struck me and he was very frustrated. So when I talked to him, the reason why I'm starting with these two vignettes is I want to also illustrate the two kind of main narratives that are happening in the region today, trying to analyze and understand <coughs> what is going on uh, in this part of the world or in the, in, the, in the Arab part of the world. One is the Arab uprisings were bad. It, our economic situation is lousy. People have become poorer and therefore they should have never happened and it's really bad for you. And you should not have had, a, you know, people should not take to the streets, go back home so we can make everything better. The other uh, narrative is that, uh, is that of identity politics, which has uh, overtaken the whole region. There's a polarization between uh, mm -hmm. uh, Muslim versus secular. Uh, and the idea that, you know, look, the Arab uprisings opened the way for these, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, particularly in Egypt, to come to power, look what they did. Look at ISIS today, if it wasn't for the Arab uprisings, we wouldn't have ISIS. So they are also bad for you. And I want to try and sort of address these two major narratives through my uh, discussion. Um, 
just to put back, sort of uh, 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 put things a bit in context, four years after the Arab mm -hmm. uprisings, uh, and bis despite the old rhetoric of, uh, you know, where we're back to the old days, there, are, there is a very substantially changed landscape. And it's not just about ISIS, it's not about borders disintegrating and uh, polarization happening, but we have new constitutions that have been put in place. There's a much wider societal dialogue about a large number of things that would, was, were not possible prior to the uprisings. There's increased political pluralism in different places for better or worse, more political parties. We heard about Tunis this morning. Uh, even in places like Yemen where you know, things are disintegrating, there is a lot more vitality and a lot more discussion happening in public spaces and in public spheres about things that matter to people in ways that were never possible prior to, 20, to December 17, 2010. Uh, even labor unions, uh, even in a country like Tunis, which has the longest, uh, uh, the, the oldest labor union in the region, um, there's been a, a large number of new labor unions that have been registered, civil society organizations, new social movements, alliances across population groups that never talk to each other. Maybe Sally can tell us a bit more about this. We saw this in Tahrir, for example, where you had everybody was celebrating the young and the old and the, the lower class and the upper class. And the idea that all of a sudden you had interactions between people who never talked to each other before. And I think we shouldn't forget this because there, this is something that is fundamentally changed and there is no going back. There is the idea that the uh, barriers of fear are broken and there is no going back. And I think it's very important to keep these things in mind um, as we move forward and as we look at the gloom and doom of uh, events as they unfold in the region today. There's also, I think, a very important thing, which is people have found their voices. And again, we cannot forget this. They, are, they want something new and they want something different. And they're very emphatic about this. The voice might be a bit lower today, but it will come out again. Um, and I think, again, this is something we need to keep in mind. Um, at the same time, we're seeing the gloom and doom, fractured social fabrics, sectarianism is gaining traction, the military is playing different roles in different countries. Uh, too many of them are just falling apart. Today, our only hope is Tunis, and even Tunis is in a very precarious situation for a number of reasons that I will not go into, but I'd, happy, I'd be happy to engage with you on this uh, in, the, in the talk. Um, so I think we, we need to, even the idea of how do you define a civic state, a lot of people say we want a civic state, but defining the civic state in the region has been more about what it's not rather than what it is. It's not military, it's not religious, but what is it we haven't been able to. But discussions started, they started and they're going, they're ongoing. We've also had major reversals in, um, in, uh, uh, in conflict. I mean, we've had an eruption of conflict across the region. I think nine countries today are, are facing conflict in our region. Uh, we've had major development reversals in a country like uh, Syria, for example. Uh, I was reading this morning uh, the, 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 the number of years that people can li live, longevity, has been cut down by 20 years in Syria. Uh, close to 80% of the population is now uh, considered poor. 30% of those who live in conflict areas are living in abject poverty, which means they can't even uh, sustain themselves and don't have the means to sustain the basic lives and livelihoods. So we've had major uh, 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 reversals in, amongst the uh, also things that have moved forward. Uh, today the region is more than 50, 53% of the world's refugees uh, live in this region, uh, even though it's the, the region is host only to 5% of the world's population. And I think it's something we need to also keep in mind. Much of what I'm describing uh, have to do with the experience of citizenship in this region. And this is also a term that was very much in vogue when the uprising started, but we've sort of forgotten a little bit about it. The idea that Despite major investments in social uh, policies by different Arab governments, um, the experience of citizenship in the sense of who gets what and where varied. There were no rights of citizenship. A lot of it was very much about uh, charity, if you like. And these were apparent in a number of interlocking political, socioeconomic, and cultural deficits. I'm going to summarize them in three key themes. 
One theme was growth without well-being, the benefits of macroeconomic growth that came as a result of the liberalization of the 1990s was unevenly distributed uh, as the state withdrew from the provision of services. Liberalization without freedom, unlike other parts of the world, economic freedom remained a pipe dream for many uh, people in this region. At the same time, uh, political uh, repression increased, uh, which ended up being with lives without dignity. Uh, so even though we had improvements in human development indicators, um, there was a uh, deterioration in uh, a different indication, indicators related to education, uh, the quality of what was being provided, and not only the quantity was pretty bad. One figure, 39 million Arabs, on the eve of the uprisings, 39 million Arabs suffered from multidimensional poverty or a serious overlap between the privations in health, in education, and in living standards. Uh, I'm just going to show this. This is uh, what this is showing. I don't know if it's very clear, but it was beyond poverty. There was also the inequality of opportunity, and I think it's also very important to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, uh, for example, access to education wasn't determined necessarily by whether you had the risk-free education or not. It was determined the quality of education that you got and whether you even went to school was very much determined by where you lived and what family you were born into, uh, among other uh, conditions. Um, why the significance of discontent? Um, the, significance, uh, the significance of discontent is because privation, the sense of you are deprived, is not sufficient for people to revolt. Um, there was a study that was done on revolutions across uh, throughout history, uh, and the one finding from that study was that for daily distresses to build up into ma mass movements, individuals first need to discover their moral anger and sense of justice. And they must also acknowledge they can do something about these injustices. And I think this is where, on December 17, 2010, uh, first Tunisians and then the rest of the region discovered that sense of moral anger and justice. What we see today in the opinion polls, um, and the reason why I'm looking at opinion polls is because uh, everybody was taken by surprise when the uprisings happened and when they first emerged. And in fact, in 2010, uh, UNDP had just launched a report that applauded, I think, 10 countries in the region for their major development gains. Um, what was missing from this rosy picture uh, was what people actually thought and how people were perceiving their own lives. And I looked at, one of the things I looked at was, were the levels of dissatisfaction among people uh, as high as we think they were? And I mapped it across a number of different issues that are quite uh, important. Uh, life evaluation, standards of living, uh, freedom in your life, educational systems, children. You know, are they satisfied with the life that their children will have? Uh, corruption, their perceptions of corruption. And what was interesting, all the red dots represent 50%. Uh, uh, so anybody, any, any figure above 50%, uh, means more than 50% of the population was not satisfied with that particular uh, indicator. So when it came to life evaluation, since 2006, more than 50% of the population in Egypt was not happy with their lives. Uh, anything beyond 40% uh, is in pink, the gray is 30%, and the black is anything less than 20%. Uh, it was the only way I could convey kind of the image very quickly to you. Another area where we talk a lot about the disintegration and the legitimacy of state organizations and state institutions. Uh, and this is, this is actually, a, it sort of shows a little bit what, the extent to which uh, people's belief or people's confidence in a not wide number of, or, uh, of uh, institutions uh, was just really collapsing. Uh, whether it's parliaments, whether it's governments, whether it's uh, labor unions, whether it's civil service, whether it's major companies even. Um, there was a real uh, disconnect between these institutions and what people really wanted. Five minutes? Ooh. Future prospects, they were quite, okay, this is now we're on speed, uh, speed dial. So I started looking at, okay, where does this leave us? Um, I looked at uh, one question, which is the extent to which people believe that they have choice and control over their lives. 
And what was interesting, if you look at Egypt, by the way, what you will see today is that uh, there are trends for Egypt, no trends for Tunis, because the database, I mean, under uh, Ben Ali, people were not allowed to do polls. Uh, so I'm able to look at how things changed in Egypt. When Tunis, it's always a snapshot. Control, choice and control over life was uh, increasing, increased dramatically uh, in 2012, uh, both for the youth, but also for the rest of the population. Uh, by classes, it also increased, and we see this amongst the uh, upper middle, lower, I mean, all of the classes, the sense of more control that they have and the fact that they can make a difference in their own lives was changing tremendously. Uh, and the same thing for Tunisia. This sense of control over their life, the sense of empowerment and that they can make a difference is coupled with a much greater interest in politics, particularly in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt. And all you need to look is at the blue line. The blue line is the extent of interest in politics and you'll see that for Egypt in 2013, it just flipped. The blue was on top and the red was on the bottom. And this tells you the extent to which, uh, the greatest interest is amongst those between 30 and 49. Interest in politics, surprisingly, in Tunisia, and this is why I asked you the question earlier, is uh, I think it's higher. We have no way of, no, at least not in this particular poll, to see what it was before. It's, uh, but it's not, uh, those uninterested are much more than those interested. It's also the same story amongst classes, particularly in Egypt. There's a tremendous interest in politics. I mean, the lower class went from 80% not interested to 70% interested between 2008 and 2012. Um, and the same story in Tunisia. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, what these present is a picture of people power, and it's translated into hundreds of political parties, civil society organizations, uh, yet associational life remains quite impoverished. Uh, moreover, there is evidence of a, lot, a much greater sense of participation by classes and by uh, age groups in public life. This is shaping their uh, opinion and world views. And this brings me to an issue that's been raised consistently this morning, particularly by Nader in the morning, about what this means for, I mean, if you close off political space, then you're going to end up having, and people are eager to engage, they're eager to make a difference in their lives, they want to participate in politics. If you close off political space, then what you're going to do is end up uh, giving them, the only option becomes is to join uh, violent groups in that sense. Um, the one thing I want to talk, I want to say about the polarization in Egypt today is people say that, yes, there is a kind of a widespread support for the clampdown that the government is extending, not only over the Muslim Brotherhood and their organizations, but also over uh, uh, any kind of civic organization, anything that builds social capital that is outside the range of the state. And again, I can give examples in the, in the, in the question and answer. But uh, what this shows is actually the polarization is not as profound as we think it is, in the sense that only 54% favor the removal of, of Morsi versus 43%. The title is Ifrim Yassisi, which means make, make minced meat out of them Sisi. Uh, people are skeptical of political participation. This was the, uh, I like this one because it says, the Egyptian people uh, uh, give the, uh, send their, their best wishes from the heart to the artist or the uh, actor Emma Watson for getting her masters. And this is written over the, uh, uh, the election uh, bill for in, in Egypt when it was Sisi and Hamdi Sabahi. This story is not about religion, and I think this is important. I'm going to end up in like, give me two more minutes, and I'll finish. This story is not about religion. Uh, it's, uh, it's really, for many Egyptians and Tunisians, uh, particularly, there is no contradiction between having religion having a public role in, 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 uh, or a role in public life and democratic ways of being. And a lot of the polls show that there are very specific questions on this issue um, that indicate the extent to which people want, uh, I mean, in Egypt it's, it's declined, but they don't see, I mean, they don't see a big difference. In Tunis, it's a bit different, and one of the questions that's been raised, uh, again, repeatedly since morning, why is it that Tunis, which has such a secular tradition, has one of the highest, if not the highest, numbers of young men, particularly, joining ISIS? And quite honestly, I think it's because um, 
the the Egyptians are much more comfortable with their identity as uh, with their religious identity than uh, perhaps uh, Tunisians because it was a taboo for such a long time. So acting out your own uh, an identity that was suppressed probably plays a role to some extent in this process, in addition to other uh, variables that have to do with urban poverty, that have to do with participation, uh, and so on, uh, among other things. What people do want, it's about leadership and stability. And perhaps this is a context, this is something we really need to look at. Uh, this is something where as civil society organizations who are working to make a difference on the ground uh, need to pay attention to. Egypt today, there's been a complete turnaround. Um, there was a question about uh, is having a good leader who is, doesn't care about parliament and doesn't care about elections, good or bad for democracy. And Egyptians from, went from being overwhelmingly, across all age groups, overwhelmingly against this to overwhelmingly for it. In Tunis, it's a mixed bag. And I think this is something that we really need to pay a lot of attention to. It goes hand in hand with understanding what democratic politics is about. Uh, there was another question about, uh, about obedience. And again, a lot of people thought it was essential. Uh, uh, obeying your ruler is essential for democracy. So I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done at that level in terms of what does being in a democratic system mean and how do we move forward beyond it. Uh, it's also about the future. Uh, people want uh, participatory politics. They want security. They want economic growth. But they also want to participate in the making of their lives. Um, and it's also about justice. And I couldn't finish without uh, showing these images. Um, this is uh, in Tahrir. And it's, uh, it's an image of a lot of the young uh, men, the youth, who lost their lives uh, fighting for what they believe is a better future for Egypt. So I don't think we can afford to forget those lives that were lost and justice for them. It's also about social justice. Uh, what this says is Noor Aynek. Noor Aynek is, uh, there was a, during the Egyptian election, and Sally can tell us more about this also. During the Egyptian election, uh, there was a song that said, uh, for Sisi, I think, that said Noor Aynek, uh, something or the other. So what this is saying is Noor Aynek, the light of your eyes is sleeping in the streets. So it's about justice, transitional justice, it's about justice for those who went, but it's also about justice, about equality of opportunity, about having the right to have dignified lives. And the revolution continues. There's another one with, this is uh, Sisi and Mubarak, but there's another one with Sisi and Morsi as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maha. I think you touched on, uh, upon a lot of uh, important issues. Uh, historic memory not being the, uh, the least important, of course, and they need to preserve uh, this memory. So I'm going to give uh, the floor to, to you, Mohammed. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Al Maskati. I am happy to be here, and I want to thank uh, Karim, who from the Casa Arabia and also Casa Arabia, to invite me. I'm actually first time in Spain. Uh, I don't know anything about Spain, but I know Real Madrid and Barcelona. And sure, I know Laila for a long, long time. She is my best friend. I'm happy to meet her again and she is the moderator, dictator moderator. Um, I'm coming from Bahrain. Uh, it is, it, I think a lot of you, they don't know where is Bahrain exactly because we are a very tiny country in the, in the, Arab, in the Arabian Gulf. Uh, I will show you in, in, the, in, the, in the map where is exactly Bahrain. I'm co-founder and former president of Bahrain of Society for Human Rights. I'm now Digital security in MENA region uh, for frontline defenders and advers advisory council member in Open Technology Fund. Uh, this is my Twitter account. If I, anyone wants to show me something, w what's the reason for the revolutions in the Arab world? From my 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 approach, I think human rights, economic, and social uh, problems. 
and other, a lot of other things. Um, when we're speaking about move, movement for change in the Arabian Gulf, this is the, the, the maps of the Arabian Gulf, and this is the Bahrain, it's that small, small country here. This is Bahrain, and you know Qatar, and sure everyone knows Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. So this is the, the map of the countries, the, council, the, the Gulf Council, where there are Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and, and Bahrain, and before where Iraq also part of the Gulf Council, but after the, um, the Gulf War, they, they kicked out the Iraq from the Gulf Council. Uh, about the economic and political interest, first of all, because of the oil. Everyone think that citizen, the citizen and in, in, uh, in the people in, in, in Arabian Gulf have oil in their house. We actually, we don't have oil in our houses. And, and that's why uh, a lot of Western governments trying to, to be silenced because of the oil and because of the uh, interest of the oil uh, coming from, from the, our countries. Second thing is the investment. Um, because our country, especially Saudi Arabia, having a lot of investment in UK, uh, in France, in the United States, and different Western governments, so there is a really economic interest in, in these countries, so that's why we need to be, as, as if as I'm seeing from the uh, Western, uh, Western governments that we need to be silenced because these countries put a lot of money in our uh, countries. Weapons, and, and because we are spend a lot of money in military and buying weapons from UK, USA, and France. And as, as a very good example, we can see that the Sweden, when they are canceled agreements with, uh, with Saudi Arabia because of the human rights uh, situation. And that's a very good step. I think we need to support it because we are working to, to, um, to ban on weapons to, to Bahrain and, and, and uh, um, Oman and Saudi Arabia because this weapons used against the protesters and used against uh, a, a, demo, a democracy movement, a democratic movement. Uh, protect Western interests in the country. I will give you one example. It's the Fifth Fleet uh, in our country, in Bahrain. Uh, United States see Bahrain is the biggest allies in the, in, in, the, in the region because we have the fifth fleet. And this fifth fleet, as they say, protect us from Iran because they think that Iran is waiting to the fifth fleet to move and come to our country and getting everything. In our country, we, don't, we are a very small country, maybe smaller than Madrid, and Iran waiting to the fifth fleet to, to move. And last thing is Iran, and Iran, and Iran. This is the, the, the biggest threats to the Arabian Gulf because Iran now are having weapons to, to, to attack Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Kuwait. And Iran is supporting, as they say, as the propaganda say, Iran supporting the protester in these countries. And, and I, we don't know actually what kind of support. Maybe they are teaching us Persian but, or giving us kebab, but actually that's what the, 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 our government say and Western governments say also. Uh, about the revolution in our countries, I can, I can say that two things, two important things, human rights, political participations, Torture, there is uh, cases of torture a lot. Uh, freedom of opinion and expression, freedom or simply, and freedom of belief. Uh, and and that's, that's the most important things for the, the people in, in, in Gulf. And also economic, uh, the wealth and the corruption. And that's, that's the main things what happening in, in, in the Gulf. This is example, I will take example of Bahrain and Saudi Arabia and Oman. You see Bahrain, the population in Bahrain is, is like 1,300,000. Uh, and, and the Bahraini is 46 
percentage of that. We have a lot of uh, Asian people and uh, uh, other Arabs who are part of the of, of in Bahrain, the military spent, uh, you can see, 3.14. Saudi Arabia, the population is, is uh, 27 million. The military also 7.9 of the GDP. And also Oman is 3 million, and the, and the military spent is 8.61. You can see they spend more money in in military than they spend this money to develop the country and to support the people to not be protesting against the government. This is a protest in, in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia and Oman. You, say, you can see the Pearl Roundabout were demolished by the government. And in Saudi Arabia, this is a protest in Katif. Uh, it is, it is a, a Shia place in, in, in Saudi Arabia. And this is in Oman, in Sahar. Uh, it is two hours from, from Muscat, the capital of uh, Oman. And regarding the crackdown, uh, in Bahrain is unique because the people of Bahrain is also unique. In Bahrain, they, they send troops from Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, to protect uh, the military building, the military buildings and government buildings from the protesters. And you can see from the picture that's the troops coming from Saudi Arabia through the, the bridge. We have the bridge between Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. So they send the troops to protect the military and the government buildings. Uh, and all of that, and still we don't, we, we don't have any weapons. Huh? We don't have weapons, but they send these troops to protect uh, the, 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 milita the military and government building. And uh, still the troops is in Bahrain. Now, four years, and we still have troops. So that's, that's show you how we are fighting dictator. We're not fighting only the Bahraini government. We're fighting Saudi Arabia, Emirates, plus UK, USA, and plus the international organization who support the government. So we are fighting the whole world. Uh, Saudi Arabia, you can see the crackdown. And in Oman, also, the, the picture showing the crackdown. About the laws, uh, Bahrain, we have constitution, uh, but this is the most laws that are used against the human rights defenders and activism in Bahrain. Uh, there is law acting, Information System Act, the Panel Code, and gathering, gathering Law. In Saudi Arabia, the funny thing is they don't have constitution, actually. And, and but they have Sharia law, Quran, and they use everything from the Quran. So they have, but they have to use act law and information system law. So that's the most important in, in, in Saudi Arabia. In Oman, they have law called al uh, It is to prevent criticism of the state and the Sultan Qaboos. So this is law you can use and against the human rights defenders, and they have new law is gathering law. So this is one of things happen in Bahrain. The government, Bahrain, and their group support, they, um, they distribute this uh, brochure uh, everywhere in Bahrain. It's saying wanted in three language. Actually, no one speak French in Bahrain, but I don't know why they have speech. Maybe they is for that. Yeah, so they want to, uh, to impact or to affect this, the French people in Bahrain. And they say it in English and in Arabic, and they say that I am supporting tourist group, so that's why I'm wanting to the, to the, to the government. After they, 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 after they released that brochure, I was threatened, I, was have get, get, I received death threats, and I was arrested by the government. And I was, I was going to complain against this brochure because the government say we don't know this group, so I was arrested when I was in the police station. Ahmed, I just want to ask you something. Did, um, is it okay if people mention you on Twitter? Yeah, or, sure. Uh, maybe Satan Wolf? No, no, it's, it's okay. okay. I'm already having more experience in investigations and jails. And you have five minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> more questions. Uh, this is the... the, the 
uh, one of the, our colleague, he is the president of BYSHR, the Bahrain Society, the new president, uh, Naji Fatil. He is sentenced for 15 years now in prison. And this is the picture we leaked from the prison and showing the, the torture. Uh, this is the guy in the picture who was uh, killed by the, the police. And the other picture, it is, it is uh, for human rights defenders, including include me, when we are protesting, starting the first protest in Bahrain, uh, and after that, they started going to the Pearl Underwood. Uh, I want to tell fast uh, regarding the, there is a, I, I think there is a gap between online and uh, offline activists. And this is the gap, it is, I think, not only in Bahrain or in, in, in the Gulf, but the whole Arab world, because people, they don't see the online activists as activists, they see them as a, a keyboard activist. So they don't relate it to the uh, real estate, or then the real, and they don't participate. But in real life, we saw a lot of online activists in the field. They are going to protest, demonstrations. They call them to protest, but also they are in the front line of the protestings. Goals and vision is not clear in, 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 in Bahrain, and not also in, in all the activism in, in the Arab uh, in the Gulf, at least. Uh, a lot of people, they want to protest and they're supporting the protest, but they don't know what is the goals and what is the vision of this protesting. And if each, each group, they have their own goals and visions. Violence and peaceful, there is arguments regarding that faster in achieving the goals. They say violence more faster than peaceful way, but Syria is, is, is real, it's real um, situation that violence does not bring justice to the people, not bring, bring democracy. Social media is became tools or goals that we want to go to use social media as a, as a, as a tools to, to help us or no, it's, a, it's our goals to use it. So that's, that's the most important now. Uh, we think that there is international immunity to, the, to Bahrain and to Arabian Gulf, that everyone's silence because there is international immunity because economic and geopolitics interest in our countries. Uh, Islamic State, because most of the Islamic State member is coming from the Gulf, is, uh, they say it's because the dictatorship uh, that people trying to go uh, uh, more free space, but I think because of education, education in Bahrain, supporting to be extremist, supporting to be uh, uh, a part of this kind of terrorist organization. The, the, the argument in, in Bahrain, and, and also I was in Syria, and they say the Sunni and Shia problems. That's the, that's the media propaganda, it's not in reality. I was in Syria four weeks ago, and I saw a lot of things happening in Syria, and also in Bahrain, it's, it's, that's the main things. We need to, to focus and to, to be, understand that the problem between Sunni and Shia is only religi religion problem, is not a political problem. Last thing, what we want, I think it's very important, a safe environment. It's very important to, to work in, in these countries in the safe environment so I can give more uh, activism or more working more with the people, uh, exposing more about human rights violation in the country. More platform like this platform so people can listen to us and can understand what's happening in our countries. Uh, increase our efficiency, that, that's very important. Training, it's very important to the people. We use a lot of, we use a social media, but we don't know how to use it uh, in, in the way we can increase uh, the awareness of the people. Thank you very much. Yes, Thank you, Ahmad. You, you said you were uh, visiting Syria a few days ago, and uh, you said something that we rarely hear here, which is uh, that people there have, um, have the will to live, and they have hope for the future, that maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but that change will come, and, and their lives will be better. 
just give us a, a couple sentences on this. I think it's a good transition. I'm actually, I'm actually surprised uh, when I was, I was in Syria four, years, uh, four, four weeks ago. I really see the future of Syria, people having hopes to change. And after Syria, I went to Iraq. Last week, I was in Iraq. I didn't see that hopes in Iraq. And I, I know in, in Syria, more, more, uh, more, uh, situation, more worse situation. But I, really, I see that the Syrian are having hope to change. And they are, they are willing to, to work with everyone uh, without seeing his background to help Syria, uh, f the future of Syria. But in Iraq, I didn't see that much of people. Uh, I see some of the sectarian things happening in Iraq. I went to a lot of places in Iraq, but Syria, I think it will be a very bright future. Something we don't get to hear often, do we? Uh, Sally, um, can't wa I can't wait to hear your insights on whether uh, there's hope and how we cope with things in the extreme context of people who have suffered uh, torture and, and abuses. Um, can you hear me? No. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Yes, okay. Hello, yeah. My name is Sally Toma. I'm a psychiatrist uh, specialized in the rehab of victims of torture and sexual abuse. Um, for 10 years now, so before the revolution even. I was working first in Oxford with refugees coming to England, and then I moved back to Egypt in 2010. Um, as you mentioned, Trotsky is very uh, dear to me, so I'm a revolutionary socialist uh, as an ideology. Uh, many of us uh, in Egypt, and uh, that, will, uh, that, that says a lot about maybe the, the past four years because they have been present uh, in, on the ground uh, for the revolution. Um, anyway, just before I, I start talking a bit about psychology and sociology and what is going on, maybe it's important um, to just mention how this <laughs> developed for me. So uh, <coughs> I started this, although I was politically active and uh, part of the groups that organized the 25th of January, for me personally, going out to the streets was uh, because of a case called, um, uh, um, if you know him, his name is Khaled Said. Khaled Said is a very famous torture case. And uh, what was very famous about it is uh, the fact that he was a middle class, a good looking boy, 20 years old, uh, 28, sorry. And uh, people identified with him. Uh, for many years in Egypt, people were used to, it's okay to beat up thugs and torture thugs and rape thugs, but it was very strange for them uh, that a good looking uh, middle class boy was actually treated this way. So that moved people a bit. Uh, on top of that, there was already movement since 2005 about enough with Mubarak and then 2008 for bread and uh, freedom and justice. So we've seen a lot of movements happening and I was involved in, in many of them um, supporting this till uh, the Khalid Said uh, happened and uh, Tunis. And I think uh, when we were in Egypt, we were saying if Tunis did it, then so could Egypt. For us, it was just a day anti-torture and anti-police. That's the police day in Egypt, January 25. And then we decided to topple the regime. So uh, came the Shab Yurid Eskatinizam, uh, the people want to, uh, to topple the regime or um, the regime to fall. Um, so yeah, this, uh, so we took to the, to the streets and Tahrir happened and it maybe was the euphoric uh, place where we call it afterwards a collective identity. So our identity, something that we can all relate to. We have this specific ideology of Tahrir I will talk about later. So it is not a leftist or a capitalist or whatever it is. It is just a specific ideology of those in Tahrir who continue to be. Um, now, four years on, I think I represent a group of Egyptians who are maybe the most isolated. We are not big in number. We are hated by everyone. Uh, we, we are anti-military and we are anti-Muslim Brotherhood leadership. So everyone hates us practically in Egypt because everyone blames us and hates us. That's the idea. And I think uh, a lot of those who continue and uh, maybe Maha showed them in the graffiti, uh, they died and fell for freedom, but now they're not even celebrated, unfortunately, in Egypt. A lot of them are said to be killed and died for nothing. And that's the problem. 
So um, just a year after the, the revolution, we, um, uh, what was happening is that people were starting to believe the military council, and we started having the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, and we were still clashing and fighting in the streets for our freedoms. We did not want parliament, we did not want politics, because we wanted the revolution to continue. And um, the media was, of course, under the regime's control, which was the military back then. And we developed, uh, or we founded uh, a campaign called Kazibun. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning it, it's because um, I believe it's a very important uh, uh, campaign when it comes to the collective memory or us trying to document our story. What Kazibun did is that we took the footages uh, of uh, all the filmmakers and all the activists who were actually were on the front lines, uh, taking uh, the real pictures of what was going on and, uh, and the violations and everything. And uh, we would make a film, and this film, uh, Kazibun means liars, so this film will expose the lies of whoever was in this film. Usually it would be a general or someone in the military saying something like, uh, we never fired anything at protesters, we killed no one. <coughs> so as he's saying that uh, on uh, media, we will be getting the shots and the visuals of exactly what was going on, that they just fired maybe at 10 now. They actually crushed protesters, uh, Christian protesters, and it's a, a massacre called Maspiro. For instance, they crushed them by the tanks, and then they said we didn't touch anyone later on. So that was the importance of Kazibun. We did made this movie and quickly asked actors activists and everyone that it's about time we become the media and it's about time we go out of Tahrir Square and not be isolated and go and show people the truth. And we organize screenings in the streets. Uh, the first month we organized 600 screenings all over Egypt and uh, that was like uh, a very important moment for us. That was December 2011 and it spread so quickly uh, that fact that a lot of people would identify with Kazibun and, and, and feel that they are part of this decentralized uh, grass uh, movement. And we continued to do that against the military council and then against the Muslim Brotherhood leadership in the streets, of course. Many projectors were destroyed and we were beaten up several times and arrests and everything, but we managed to actually screen on the buildings of the TV building itself, being the factory of the lies. Even uh, we did it on the defense ministry and that was a, a very cool moment. We just you know, screened on the defense ministry and then ran quickly as we could because uh, it was a lot of clashes then. So. Uh, a bit later we were crushed, of course, uh, a lot of things went wrong and I'm not going to get into details of that, but later on uh, we decided that maybe the way to continue is to at least fight for the memory and the collective memory of the Egyptian people because they're now being told the wrong things. And as a psychiatrist working with uh, torture and, uh, and looking at all the sociological changes and what happened, I was asked to write for Madame Asr a series of articles on this issue, everything related to the psychological um, situation uh, in Egypt and around Egypt, because there are a lot of uh, similarities, of course. So one of the articles is called Reckons and Dreams. So we go to a lot of funerals, like a lot of times we had like five funerals a week or something like that, but then we have to continue to dream and continue to move on. Um, these are the words of uh, a rape victim I'd like to read and share because it says a lot. And uh, she uh, spoke of or said these words after uh, the presidential election, so after Sisi came to power. And uh, she was actually raped by um, pro Sisi um, the state security, which is a common thing. So she says, I often get visuals of my rape. I can still smell his sweat on me. I sometimes see myself crucified naked in Tahrir as people pass me by, banging their drums to the tune of Tislam al Ayadi. Tislam al Ayadi is a military propaganda uh, song. Without any empathy to my raped, crucified body on display. Election day was a strong trigger for my reliving and I only allowed myself out of the house when I heard that many youth boycotted. Apart from reliving my trauma, I also get revenge fantasies. The feeling of injustice is an obstacle to my healing and getting over my PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. 
as there is no closure in sight. I am expected to get on with my life while everything around me reminds me of my assailants and how they conquered the nation as they conquered my body. Um, these are her words, of course. Uh, she survived the state-sponsored sexual assault. Um, she will not be pressing any charges because this is another problem we have in Egypt. Uh, first, she has no faith in the judicial system, but on top of that, she also gets threats about her own private life, that if she speaks, her own private life will be exposed as everything is recorded and they always threaten to just air our private lives. So um, despite the despair around her, of course, she's still fighting and she waits for a collective justice as well. And she's doing what she can, but she will not be pressing charges. The gas chamber, that's also one of the biggest violations in Egypt. Of course, there is the Raba massacre, which was the biggest thing, and that's uh, uh, in August too. But four days later, uh, in, in August uh, 18, 2013, after being detained for three days, 37 detainees, including Sharif Siam, uh, whom I knew also personally, were killed when a tear gas canister was fired into the vehicle transporting them from uh, Heliopolis police station to Abu Zawal. So practically, a police officer just threw a, canister, a tear gas canister inside a small tank and just left them to suffocate and burn, and that's how they died. Uh, on March 18, Vice Warden of Heliopolis Police Station received 10-year prison sentence and three other police officers were handed one year suspended, but all this verdict was actually annulled four uh, months later, so it means no one is charged, no one is paying the price for this. And of course, for his family, this means healing is not possible because people are okay about this happening without any uh, retribution or even accountability. Uh, I know his mom, so I'm her psychiatrist, and uh, what she tells me is that uh, what deepens the wound a lot and keeps the trauma fresh is that her son was labeled a terrorist, an MB affiliate, thus someone who deserved such a treatment. People actually feel it's okay to treat them this way. Retribution is the only justice she can accept, but such closure is not expected in light of the general consensus that it's okay to kill a Muslim Brotherhood affiliate, it's not a problem. He was burnt alive and gassed to death, of course, and the death was celebrated by many, and that's the sad part. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, I just want to say quickly about another, another boy. Uh, this boy, he was raped during the Morsi administration. So it shows that they're all the same, nothing, nothing is different. Uh, this boy is 16 years old, he was caught by the uh, military police. So here we have the police raping, military police raping, and the military itself. So they all practice the same thing. Uh, he was uh, raped uh, by the military police once, and then he was raped again by the police in another police station where I had to go and intervene actually. And then he was raped for the third time and he kept on attracting this trauma because every time he's released he will just go back and uh, get attacked or go back to protest or whatever and they catch him again and they continue to do this to him. Of course his shame was his biggest problem and facing women or mothers. He said he couldn't face his mother or his sisters because now he's not the man anymore that he used to be. So it does happen to men and women in Egypt and it's a very strong weapon they use now. It's on the rise uh, for seculars or Muslim Brotherhood affiliated. It doesn't really make a difference, okay? Um, I'm trying to be quick, okay. Uh, in one of the articles, or actually the, the, the introductory article, I chose something called The Cuckoo's Nest. It's a movie, I'm not sure if, uh, if everyone knows, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, because that's exactly what happened uh, to uh, the revolutionaries or us in Egypt. So it is someone who thought they're very smug and they are capable to actually beat the system. He entered the, the mental uh, health uh, institution and actually tried to defy the nurse, which was the regime in this sense. And and at the end of the, the, the movie, what we see is that his own mental health was crushed and he actually had like sort of a brain death, like he was not functioning anymore. And it was the person in the movie who was silent all through and everyone thought had issues who managed to escape to freedom. So uh, in this introductory article, I was asking the question, will our end be like him, this protagonist who thought he would defy and just you know die mentally and, and his soul at the end, or will we manage to actually fly 
uh, outside the cuckoo's nest, you know, into freedom, because Egypt is the cuckoo's nest at, at this point. Um, the collective identity of Tahrir, it is something I've written about as well, and it's important to, to uh, just to say this part of who everyone is. So the collective identity of Tahrir is our identity, in a way. As I said, it's an ideology that you'll find in it leftists and, and others and the people who believe or not believe. It's not the issue at all. What brought us together was the opposition of this regime. So sociologists would say that a lot of times groups form and ideologies form just in opposition of something that is causing uh, oppression or treating them all the same. So in a way, if the police sees us all as worthy of being killed, then we unite together against this police. So they are the ones making us unite. And afterwards, what happened is that we got united in reality, but also that made them think by fragmenting us, we can also be isolated again and it will be easier to break us once more. And maybe that's what happened. Mina Daniel uh, is, a, is an activist, a comrade, a 20 year old. I knew him as well, a young comrade in my uh, movement. Uh, he was killed in the Maspiro massacre against uh, the Christians, but he was never a Coptic activist. He was an Egyptian activist, actually fighting for the poor and the socialists. And, uh, and he, he, he is famous for this part that he kept the collective identity of Tahrir. Uh, Shaima Sabah is, a, is a, a, a friend as well, <laughs> like all of them gone anyway. So Shaima Sabah uh, is uh, one of uh, our recent martyrs. Uh, she died uh, January 24 this year uh, as she was marching to Tahrir, carrying some flowers to commemorate the 25th of January, January. And she was killed by the police. And we call her the flower of the revolution now because she was only carrying a flower and that's all. Um, but she kept it too. This is us, the collective uh, Tahrir. The other side is the side who dehumanizes us, and that's part of the articles as well. The fact that they kill us means that they don't see us as humans, okay? First, they identify us as target. They dehumanize us. They tell the whole place that we are not worthy of any moral or good humane treatment, and that's how they allow people to cheer on for blood later on for our blood. This, of course, happened uh, for a very long time in different uh, settings, and it happened in Rabaa with the Muslim Brotherhood, and later on, of course, and with us, with women and uh, Christians, anyone really who is different or outside of the, uh, of, of the, the elite uh, circle around the regime can be dehumanized and so easily conditioned to kill. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap up very quickly, I'm, I'm sorry, okay. Um, I, I just wanted to explain a bit about how these things work, but anyway, okay, I won't be able to do that, except if you ask me uh, later on. But uh, yeah, um, so as I said, there are those who are conditioned to kill, and there is us, the dehumanized, and then there is the cheering on for blood, where it comes from the public, and how this is formed sociologically that we teach people to actually ask for this. Uh, I wanted to go into this, but I won't be able to. So anyway, if you are aware of Orwell and 1984, we have a Ministry of Truth, which is the Ministry of Propaganda and Lies and Revisionism. We have a Ministry of Love, which is the Ministry of Torture. And we are not all Winston Smith because not all of us allowed that the regime conquers them at the end. So some of us are still actually trying to rebel this. Uh, what we're dealing with is the trauma, the PTSD, of course, the burnout that a lot of us and a lot of activists are feeling and someone else needs to continue because we're very tired. It's been four years of this. The violence, of course, the anxiety. Suicide is on the verge now and it's getting higher and higher in Egypt, among males even more than females. And uh, this has been going on for one year now that it's the highest time ever. Um, the idea is to put it in a nutshell, we have a wounded Egypt and uh, an area in conflict, but we have a ministry that is called transitional justice that we don't know if it has offices or not, but it has a minister who goes to human rights uh, places with the UN or so forth and says Egypt is great about human rights and that's his idea of it. Uh, our fight, just to wrap this, uh, is not now very much on the ground because it is uh, everyone I know is either imprisoned or tortured or threatened or whatever. Uh, our fight, we decided to be the fight for the collective memory. Even if the revolution itself is crushed, we continue to document and make sure that everything is documented and our narrative and story is being told 
till the day we can actually get justice served, until the day we can actually have a proper uh, uh, um, retribution and transitional justice. The graffiti, the tweeting, writing and documenting the videos, the kazibun, musurin, all these uh, things, whether artistic or culture, are very important now, and it's what we're focusing on. At least we're having small successes in this bigger picture or that shows that we're all very, very, very crushed. Um, just, uh, uh, just to end it, <laughs> and that's it. Uh, there is a, uh, something that happened uh, in February that uh, it was all over uh, TV everywhere. We had 21 Coptic Christians who were uh, abducted in Libya and were slain by uh, ISIS or in Libya. And the Egyptian government decided, I love my Copts, I love the Christians and stuff, so I'm going to go with Emirates and uh, just uh, uh, bomb them uh, in Libya because I really want to retaliate for the same Christians I crushed three years before and for the same Christians I treat them like second grade citizens and that shows how they play on the nationalism when they want to and killing any sort of patriotism or love and this is also another problem we are facing in Egypt. I, there is no access to mental health services in Egypt that's it. Everyone uh, doesn't get any treatment. And I think what we're working on as well is maybe the possibility of NGOs focusing on this psychological element of conflict, that in conflict people really suffer and they need access or else things are going to be totally out of control. Thank you so much. Thank Sam. you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Quick.